Good morning Gap Church and all of those who are tuned in for the very first time. Welcome to our online service. I trust you all had a good week as spring has sprung upon us and that a new season is lying ahead. Be encouraged, be excited for what the Lord has in store for you. I want to encourage each and every one of you this morning to share the link with friends and families. Those that we've been praying for for a very long time, now is your opportunity. Share the word, share it and send it far and wide to the ends of the earth. Perfect opportunity, so go ahead and do that right now. How I would love to see each and every one, each and every one of you this morning, to receive a hug, a warm welcome and a kiss. But remember, we are all still gathering to worship and to lift His name up high, even though we're all in our own homes. I want to encourage you with Isaiah 41 verse 10 this morning. That says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will lift you up with my righteous right hand. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For I am your God. What a wonderful promise that we shouldn't be afraid, that we shouldn't, shouldn't worry because our God is in control. Hold on to that promise this week. In Jesus' name. Come, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you this morning. Thank you for your word and thank you for your promise. Help us to hold on to that, Father. When tough times come, that we hold on to your promises, Lord Jesus. And Lord, this morning I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill our hearts and fill our homes, Lord Jesus, so that we can receive your word. And Lord, as we walk away from the service this morning, that we would be a changed person. Help us to be on fire and excited about you, Lord Jesus. Help us not to grow cold. Be with us, be with the worship team, be with Rory as he brings his, your word to, unto us this morning, Lord Jesus. We thank you and we want to give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week until we meet again next week. In Jesus' name, Amen. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. And righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name Christ alone God
Good morning, everyone. What a blessing and privilege it is to be part of this electronic service, our 24th broadcast since the lockdown started on the 26th of March. It's been truly humbling to see how our congregation has responded to the call to remain faithful in their tithes and offerings, despite the forced changes to daily lives and the uncertainty of what the future holds. A very big thank you to those folks who resisted electronic banking for so long but we have now embraced the convenience of EFT and SnapScan banking. Details of those are on the screen now. Today I'd like to look at the questions, what is a tithe and why do we tithe? The word tithe comes from Hebrew and literally means a tenth. Genesis 14.20 reveals that the first person in the Bible who tithe was Abraham, who, after returning victorious from battle, gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Verses 19 and 20 tell us why Abraham did this. Melchizedek blesses Abraham and ascribes his victory to God, and Abraham responds in gratitude. And so it should be with us. We are called to be generous givers and should do so in gratitude for what God has done and continues to do for us every day. Whatever we have comes from Him, and we should honor Him by giving back into His kingdom. Thanks to your generosity, we've been able to uh, honor all of our commitments throughout this lockdown and we've been able to assist about 30 struggling families with food, blankets and clothing and that's exactly what God expects us to do. We do this in gratitude. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your son Jesus and through him the gift of eternal life. Lord, help us to be generous givers we ask that you bless our tithes and offerings, Lord, and pray that you would help us and guide us to spend them wisely in the extension of your kingdom. We ask all these things in your precious and wonderful name. Amen. I hope that you enjoy the rest of our service. Be blessed. Good morning, everyone. I greet you all in the wonderful name of Jesus. How amazing is it that we serve a God that we can go to at any time, any place, and we are guaranteed that He is listening and hearing our prayers and our hearts. Just as children can freely go to their earthly dads for anything that they desire, how much more can we ask of our Heavenly Fathers? This morning, as we enter a time of prayer, let us stand together as one, united, as we make our requests known to God. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you today in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for answered prayer and for coming through for us once again. Thank you for our Sunbeam School, where we had a really good turnout this week. We pray that you will bless the school financially and continue to increase their numbers. May the kids flourish even through these extraordinary times. Thank you, Lord, for the lovely rains that have fallen on our lands, for it is only by your grace. We thank you, Father, for our GAP ministries and leaders who add so much value to our lives. 
we pray, dear Lord, for a special blessing on them. Lord, this morning we also stand in the gap for our church family and friends that are unwell, and we give thanks for those who are in recovery. We remember Jossie Ne, who is recovering from a knee up. We pray that she will be back on her feet again soon, and that all her discomfort will cease. We bring Peter Horseman before you. As he recovers from a car accident, we pray, Lord, for a speedy recovery. Grant him a special touch from above during this challenging time. We also remember Kevin Mitchell, who is undergoing therapy. We pray that you would grant him an extra measure of strength. Guide his attending specialist and be with his family as he undergoes treatment. Lord, we also remember Matthew Ingram, who is in a critical condition in hospital. We ask, Lord, for a miracle of healing for him and that one day he may grow on to be a powerful testimony for you. We also remember all the folks who have lost loved ones and are grieving. I pray for Sylvia Kapani, who lost her sister and brother-in-law this week, as well as the Ingram family, who lost their young daughter. Please grant these families peace in the midst of their turmoil. May they find comfort in you, Lord. Surround them with your love during this time and grant them emotional healing. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness, and we continue to place our faith, our hope, and our trust in you completely. Bless us, Lord, as we commit the week ahead into your hands. For we ask all these mercies in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. You are perfect all of your ways. 
It's lovely to be back with you all today and I wish to continue with the series that we have been doing on our devotions on the life and words of Jesus. Uh, to recap then, uh, what we've covered so far is this. We've looked at the announcements of uh, regarding his birth and the visit by the shepherds and the wise men. We have looked at the early predictions about his ministry when he was taken to the temple as a baby. And then Grant on Friday shared about the only recorded incident of his childhood years, when he was found debating with the teachers of the law as a young boy. Apart from that, there is nothing else. 
And so we now set for the time with the next event recorded in the scriptures and the gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke. And it's the coming of John the Baptist. The little child of Elizabeth and Zechariah promised to be the forerunner of the Messiah is now grown up as a man and ready to begin his ministry. It appears he's been in the desert of Judea for some time. His clothing, made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, uh, was indicative of his station as a prophet. He'd been living off locusts and wild honey, and he makes his public appearance in the region of the Jordan River. And because he is the first prophet that anyone has seen in their lifetime, all the people flock out to see him from Jerusalem and Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. He preaches a message of the need for baptism as a sign of repentance for the forgiveness for their sins. And all the people confess their sins and get baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now, Religious leaders uh, come down as well to be baptized. Uh, they're known because of their differing theological views as the Pharisees and the other parties, the Sadducees. And so they come down in their robes uh, to presumably be baptized by him. Uh, now John is a prophet anointed by God and you'll be aware that prophets are outspoken and don't mince their words. So as these religious people come down the hill towards the Jordan River, John says to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Produce fruit that is in keeping with repentance. And don't rely on the fact that you are descendants of Abraham. God doesn't need you. He can raise up from these very stones children of Abraham. God is ready to cut down with his axe and throw into the fire any tree that does not bear fruit. Wow, take that sports lovers. If John wanted to antagonize the authorities, he has just succeeded spectacularly. But that is the way with prophets, isn't it? They just tell it like it is, and that's what he did that day. Let's have a look at what his mission was then. He gets about his main reason for his coming is his announcement about the Messiah. And so I'm going to read now from Scripture, Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. These were his words. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I. The thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He just had to add that last bit on about judgment, final judgment, just to ensure people knew what was at stake here. Now, because of John's obvious popularity and influence the priests and Levites also came to ask him and inquire of him and they asked him are you the Christ are you the Messiah and John said I'm not then are you Elijah they asked remembering that the Jews had taken Malachi's prophecy literally and expected uh, Elijah would return before the Messiah arrived John said I'm not are you the prophet no I'm not he replied so who are you, they asked. And he replied in the words of Isaiah, the prophet, I am the voice of one crying out in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. And then one day, the, uh, arriving on the scene, appears Jesus. He comes from Galilee in the north to the Jordan to be baptized by John the Baptist. The Gospel of John records that when John the Baptist saw Jesus approaching, he said to the crowd, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. The reason I came baptizing with water is that he might be revealed to Israel. Now when Jesus 
comes down and asks to be baptized. John tries to deter him. He says, I, I need to be baptized by you. Jesus answers, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Now, as soon as Jesus was baptized by John and he leaves the water, heaven was opened. And John sees the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. Then he hears a voice from heaven saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. He then goes on and says, I must decrease and he must increase. After identifying the Messiah, he continues baptizing because people continues to come to him at a place called Anon near Salem. Some people come to John and his disciples and, and say, in effect, are you not worried about the fact that the man you testified about is baptizing on the other side of the Jordan River? And everyone's going to him. And listen to his words now, his self-effacing words, which I re uh, record in the gospel of uh, John 3, 28, 30. You yourselves can testify that I said I'm not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must increase. I must decrease. Incredible words, incredible self-effacement by John the Baptist. The Gospel of Luke tells us all this occurred in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was the governor of Galilee in the north. Herod's brother Philip was the governor of another Roman province north of Galilee called Ituria. Now there is a sobering Closing comment in Luke's account in chapter 3, verses 19 to 20. He says, When John rebuked Herod because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod locked up John in prison. So not only did John publicly challenge the religious leaders of the day, but this firebrand of a prophet then went head on and challenged the political appointee of the Romans, Herod, the governor of the province of Galilee. So he wasn't afraid. Herod was a Jew and he was breaking the law of God in taking his brother Philip's wife, Herodias. He was committing adultery and he was the leader of the Jewish nation. But what I find after John's imprisonment to be one of the most fascinating passages in the whole of the New Testament is the reaction of John the Baptist when he is in prison. Let me read uh, from Matthew 11 uh, to When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? So here we have the first prophet in 400 years who has identified the Messiah as the Lamb of God for the people of Israel. He's witnessed the Holy Spirit descend like a dove on him. And he's heard a voice from heaven affirming the sonship of Christ. Now he's doubting whether he's in fact the Messiah. Amazing. Has John got it wrong? So doubt and fear happens to the best of us. And yes, we all go through doubt at times. We're all aware of that all too clearly. The question we ask is, why would John start to doubt now? Well, the obvious fact, he's in prison. He's facing a probable death for his public criticism of the leader of the day, Herod, and his adulterous relationship with Herodias, his brother's wife. The only thing that's keeping John alive is the fact that Herod likes to listen to him from time to time. But his life, you must realize, hangs in a th like a thread. It's tenuous. And most of us are aware of the story of the party later on where alcohol is flowing. And Herodias' daughter obviously does some seductive dance before Herod at the party. And he offers her, in the presence of his guests, anything she asks for. Now guess what she asks for? Well, she goes to her mother and, and asks her mother. And her mother says, I want you to ask for the head of John the Baptist to be brought to you now on a platter. 
And that's the end of John's life as he is beheaded. You can read about it in Matthew and Mark 6, 14 to 29. So I would imagine that in prison with a lot of time to think that despair would have crept into John's mind. He would probably think something like this. If I'm God's anointed prophet preparing the way for the Messiah, how is it that God is not delivering me from prison? We've all probably asked God questions like that in the past. Why he hasn't answered our prayer for healing or for deliverance? Even the prophets of the Old Testament often ask God similar questions. Where are you? What's taking so long? Why are you not answering? Why does evil prosper and the righteous seem to suffer? And these are all legitimate questions which we have, and God is not ashamed to allow them to be recorded in Scripture. It's honest. They're honest questions. Doubt sometimes creeps in when heaven is silent. So John, like the rest of us, went through a period of doubt and sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one or should we look for another? And Jesus answers by quoting from scripture in Isaiah 61. And the quote is recorded in Matthew 11 verses 4 to 6. Go back and report to John what you hear and see the blind receive their sight the lame walk or those who have leprosy are cleansed the deaf hear the dead are raised and the good news is proclaimed to the poor blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me and that last section is for john specifically don't stumble john hold on as i said he's quoting from isaiah 61 and other passages in isaiah and he's in effect saying to john's disciples go back and tell john what you see is happening and they obviously do that. And obviously when they come back to John, he realizes it. He says, of course, of course, he is the Messiah. What, I, what was I thinking? What was I doubting him for? You see, when faith, get, faith gets tested, that's when it grows. That's when it produces guts and endurance. Read James chapter 1. God tests our faith to see if it's the real thing. Remember, Abraham, the forefather of the faith, got tested hugely when God said, I want you to sacrifice your boy Isaac and we know what happened then when God delivered him. So what was Jesus' estimation of this prophet in conclusion? This prophet from the wilderness, this rough man who spoke his mind. I read from Matthew 11, 7 to 15. Jesus says, Truly I tell you, among those born of woman, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. For all the prophets and the law prophesied and tell John. And if you're willing to accept, he is the Elijah who was to come. So Jesus gives high tribute to John, high praise. Yes, he was the second Elijah coming in the power and authority that Elijah had. Yet without any miracles or signs or wonders, he just fulfilled his calling to prepare the way of the Lord. He did it in a self-effacing way. I must decrease, he must increase. He was not hanging around in the limelight too long, giving all of the glory to Jesus. He preached fearlessly as he challenged sin and suffered the consequences for his obedience in the same way that his master Jesus did in the future. Bless you with these thoughts as we reflect on the life of John the Baptist. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for a man like John who was obedient to the call. Help us like him to not stand and linger in the limelight but to preach the gospel and share the good news of christ unashamedly and boldly that others might hear the word of god and so be saved bless us give us the strength as we seek to do that we ask all these things in your precious name and for your glory let's conclude our service with the last a worship song
come to the end of the service, I'd like to thank you for spending this hour with us. I trust the service has been a blessing to us all. Oh Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for reminding us daily that your gospel is for all people of all nationalities and all ages to hear and that it is our responsibility to share it far and wide. Father, we thank you for coming into our homes today and we take comfort in the fact that your Holy Spirit will be with us for the rest of the week until we meet again. Amen. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us from this day until Jesus comes again and then forevermore.